Moving from the NIH to the CDC, the CDC published in its MMWR uh, within the last couple of weeks, that's m m mor Morbidity Mortality Weekly Review, which goes over a myriad of topics. This particular um, paper by Marzek et al. described five individuals who had severe complications from Mybia antibiotics. There were major problems with it, and, and I published in the PubMed Commons a ret retort to, to this article. Uh, there were several concerns. One is they cherry-picked people who were clearly uh, adversely impacted, which is, is a shame whenever that happens with well-intentioned treatment. Uh, but how about the thousands of people who have benefited, who have benefited from, from treatments? They, they made three claims that, that I described in, in my response in the PubMed Commons. One was that chronic Lyme disease doesn't exist. We've already discussed some of the supportive evidence for which I believe persistence both pre-treatment and post-treatment. They, they also said the two-tiered system is very sensitive. We've already discussed that. And then the third alludes to the two, two out of the four NIH trials where they said long-term antibiotics don't work. Well, in fact, the Fallon study showed that there was statistically significant improvement in pain and functional, uh, functionality, and the Krupp study showed that there was persistent benefit to fatigue in but, those studies. But the MMWR paper was never meant to be a statement about the likelihood of an adverse outcome. It was merely a statement that no, there, I there don't can agree be a, with you. I, I, I understand. They I understand. said, do not use well, long-term antibiotics. It's there, dangerous. There are, there are, it's there, dangerous. Yes, there are other studies that have demonstrated that these that antibiotics, IV or even oral, are not without consequences of the, on their own. Okay, that's, that's the entire Absolutely. point I want to make. But, but, and, and the point you're making is well taken, and part of the comments, this conclusion that I make is that you need to identify, do a careful uh, differential diagnosis, be proactive in probiotics and all of the protective oversight that you need to do, <coughs> and not use antibiotics unless you have to. But the take-home message that I and many others took from that MMWR piece was that long-term antibiotics don't work, you shouldn't do it, period. Okay, well, let me ask that, you. And that's, that's an overbroad well, statement. Well, I agree. Well, but but that's how many but people there's are There's something else, there's something, and I, this may segue into page will, under seven. It will, but go ahead. <laughs> um, when you've got a person who is not well, chronically not well, and very confused, and most of the times, at least in my experience, people who have chronic symptoms that have been resistant to everything that anybody's done for them, are confused. They may be angry, they may be, they, there are many, many feelings are going on. One of the problems that, that I'm concerned about, aside from antibiotic toxicity and the, the potential for line sepsis in somebody who's got a, a chronic indwelling catheter, is that first of all, by, by giving a diagnosis of chronic Lyme disease that has been refractory to antibiotics, you're instilling a fear factor that I think is not really often discussed. If I have a disease that does not respond to anything that all my doctors have given me, and I still have it, what is the future for me? That's my, that's my first point after the MMWR piece. And the second point that I'd like to make is that there are people who are diagnosed as having chronic Lyme disease who have something else. Okay. And, and the, the well, people with I, I, rheumatoid yeah, arthritis following Lyme, infection, Lyme disease infection, those people did well on methotrexate, which is a drug used for okay. Let me, rheumatoid arthritis. Well, I wanna, be, before we go anymore, I want to put a button on a few things. And I will give you another shot. I promise. The first thing is, can we say that patients, some patients are experiencing something that goes on long after the initial infection, whatever that something is, and that needs to at least be acknowledged. Is that fair? Yes. 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 That's a yes. Yes. We've gotten to yes. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> now, Far out. Number two, there is, when you talk about a conspiracy, implicit and embedded in a conspiracy, that there's some deeper malfeasance, that somebody's gaining from something by doing something else. And are you, if you are, please tell me, and who's gaining? Well, I, I, I'm sorry, but I absolutely, you said I could interrupt, and I'm yes. going to interrupt. Please I interrupt. I need to address what Dr. Siegel said about the fear that patients have. 
I can safely say after 33 years of traversing this country and meeting with tens of thousands of Lyme patients and their families in every kind of setting, I've taken them into doctor's appointments, I had them in my home when they were sick, um, and so on and so forth. And I can tell you their greatest fear is not of having a diagnosis of chronic Lyme, but of not being able to have chronic Lyme as a diagnosis because that prevents the physicians from treating them okay. for the disease that they really have. But let's go back to the real, what I asked you. If there is a conspiracy, if there is a, a them out there that wants to prevent, let me finish, that wants to prevent this being researched and being diagnosed and nailed down, who is the them and what are they gaining from it? I can only say that when Attorney General Blumenthal in 2008 did an investigation into the IDSA guidelines. And what he uncovered at that time is there was a massive amount of undisclosed vested interest among the creators of the guidelines. And so, yeah, that, that's problematic because that implies that they have a vested interest. They get to define the disease, they get to uh, s pretty much select the test, be involved with the test for the disease. They were involved with the vaccines. And many of them were involved as paid consultants to insurance companies going up against physicians so, who were so treating that I, I, our just patients. Just before anything else, let me just nail it down. At the end of the day, what part of your argument is that the insurance company didn't want to pay for long-term care, these guys and women were in the pocket of the insurance companies, and they wanted to deny the existence, the insurance companies wouldn't have to bail them out. Is that what you're saying? I didn't say that. Don't put that words in my no, mouth. I wonder, that's but I'm, I'm merely you. saying that there's a lot of vested interest involved in a disease which we don't have enough research funds, and Dr. Siegel okay. alluded to that earlier. But we actually if, have you know, $35 million is being expended by the uh, uh, federal government on the disease, 25 in, in uh, NIH and 10 for CDC, and now we have the, the new government program, that's another five. That is it. So we, we are not getting the research that is necessary. Okay. Other diseases are like getting a lot of it. One, one small thing, one small, small thing. Having been on the, on the receiving end of accusations like the ones that you've just, you two have just described, I find it very interesting that there is uh, a frequent allegation that the work that is done in academic centers is somehow tainted, that we are somehow in the hip pocket of somebody or another, that we're doing it for nefarious reasons. I don't recall anybody on, on the academic wing turning to you and to, to the ILADs and to other organizations and making accusations uh, at some... You're I, kidding, I, I, right? Good example. No, 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 please, <laughs> let me finish. I don't recall. It may have happened. But I can assure you that the people with whom I work don't understand some of the things that are being said by the other, the other school of thought. But it's not, I, I've never heard anybody in my group yes. say they're, they're, they're frauds, they're bums, they're, they're, they're somehow um, raking off profits. I've been in peer review, trashed I, in peer review. That, right. No, and, I, and no you, what I'm talking about example. is somehow being in the hip pocket of something or other. Somehow there's a conspiracy on the other well, end. I'll I've never you, heard that. I'll give you oh. a good example. Okay, okay please. One example and right. then I want to and that, and that is this, this, this concept that, that people who have evolved their interest in treating these chronic symptoms that we often characterize as chronic Lyme, that uh, I've had at least two papers rejected by the reviewers who have said that, well, you earn more than $10,000 a year in treating these people, therefore you've got a vested interest that's in ridiculous. it. That's what the I, ideas I, I say. That's, that's what the that's, ideas that's say. Ridiculous. That's, well, that's, but, but that's an example. I, okay. that, that's when I look at corrupting influence, I think of money, ego, and power. And then you can usually get the answer. That's or usually follow the, the money. Yes. Okay.